Today on Beers TV, we're gonna talk reef tank pests. Hey guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the Beer S160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. This week, we're gonna discuss some of the most common pests and methods of preventing them or dealing with them after the fact. When I say pests, it means all kinds of things, from flatworms, little red bugs, parasitic nudibranchs, snails, spiders, anemones like atasia, crabs, bristleworms, fireworms, mantis shrimp, isopods, copepods, amphipods, protozoa, and even some things you might intentionally put in the tank, like green star polyps or xenia. Fair warning, last week we shared that an ounce of prevention with algae is worth a pound of cure. With many of the pests that we're discussing today, prevention is the only option. Once they've been introduced to the tank, your only option is often just managing the issue. Eradicating these pests from your tank ranges from very hard to completely impossible, or at least logistically implausible. Since the only solution to many of these pests is keeping them out of the tank to begin with, a strong prevention strategy is what I'm gonna start with today. How serious you should take all this should be closely related to two things. How much time and money you have invested in the tank and how devastating it will be if you have to start over at some point. I will say that virtually no one is aware of or even follows this advice when they first start their tank. So if you're in that boat currently and fighting some type of issue, don't feel like you're alone. In fact, you're likely in the majority. However, most people will take it more seriously on their second tank and often seriously dedicated to keeping pests out of their tank on their third or after. It's obviously going to be based quite a bit on your personal experiences. If Aptasia, bubble algae, or fireworms were a nuisance before, you might start by inspecting and dipping your purchases. But if you lost $2,000 coral and a five-year-old tank to acre-eating flatworms, you might be pretty darn aggressive with the next go-around. I guess if you were asking, I would say do every last step of what I'm about to recommend, but that's just not realistic for most people, so I'll scale that back to do what you can and the best you can, and note that the most awesome thing that can happen is it will seem like a complete waste of time because you'll never encounter any of these things you're trying to avoid, so they might not even seem real except virtually everyone else has them. I think the first part of this is sourcing your corals. It just isn't in the best interest of many people who sell corals to talk about these pests or invasive species because they're in almost every holding facility, wholesaler and retail environment out there. There's just too many corals flowing through these systems for it to be possible to prevent pests from entering these systems. I think you more or less have to accept that there is a significant risk of hitchhiking pests with any wild collected coral. I think the first step in avoiding this is shopping at a store that keeps their tanks clean, well maintained and free of pests. If the tanks are visually teeming with aptasia and bubble algae, it would be wise to assume that the corals you are buying come with a whole variety of pests. You couldn't pay me enough to take a coral out of a system like this and put it in my tank. I think another good idea might be just ask your favorite store how they take new corals in. Hopefully there's some sort of dip process and potentially coral quarantine, but that'd be pretty rare and representative of a pretty awesome fish store. Buying online is even harder because you can't see the holding tanks, more or less you have to judge them mostly on their reputation within the community and looking at what they send you. If the corals they send you have pests or their bases are covered in algae, I might select another vendor. I think you can also get a general idea of what's potentially in these systems by dipping the coral and just looking at what falls off. In general, I have to say if you can, skipping wild collected corals altogether is your best bet, but that's just not possible with many species. The better aquaculture facilities and even hobbyist operations have done a pretty awesome job of keeping pests out of their systems. For instance, a vast majority of the corals we ultimately kept in the BRS-160 ended up being small aquacultured frags from places like battle corals, unique corals, worldwide, and some of the wild stuff we got from Austin Aqua Farms is the best because he takes care of his systems. I have to say, if I was doing an SPS only tank, which is a significant investment, I'd be very tempted to select a single vendor I trust and only work with them. Everyone here was particularly impressed with the battle coral selection and photo accuracy, so they'd be a good option for that. In fact, I moved a couple months ago and currently tankless at the moment. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw a battle coral only themed tank in the future. That way I can be pretty confident I won't run into any pest issues. I know I'm jinxing myself, but it would appear that we avoided any major pests in the BRS-160 primarily with just selecting quality vendors to work with. In relation to sourcing, I'll also mention rock as well. The more live your rock is when you get it, the more likely it is to come with these pests. Dead dry rock seems to be the default option for a lot of reefers for this reason. 
Next steps are just visual inspection and plug removal. Give the coral a pretty close inspection. Look for signs of pests, bite marks, eggs, or anything else. I also try to remove the entire mount the coral comes on and use my own. There are just too many areas for pests to hide on many coral mounts. If you find a pest in the inspection process, you can choose to treat it, manually remove it, give it to someone you hate, or throw it out. This is just one of those things where you might feel bad for the coral or your wallet by throwing it out, but you're also potentially saving the lives of all the corals and dollars you're already caring for. Next step is dipping. Like everyone else, I've been guilty of being a lazy dipper in the past, but that ship has sailed and I dip everything now. Not only would I not put an undipped coral in the 160, but if I caught someone doing that, I might punch him in the face. It's that big of a deal. Dipping is super easy and there's no excuse not to. The most popular options being iodine dips, freshwater dips, retail products like Coral RX and Sprung's Revive, and more recently dips with things like Bear Insect Killer. Iodine dips are the most popular with LPS and polyps where bacterial infections are the most common. Revive and Coral RX are the most popular general all-around dips. I don't think you'll be surprised that Bear Insect Killer is the most popular with the advanced reefer crowd. Everyone has a favorite, but for the most part they all seem to be effective and pretty safe. At face value, the bear insect killer seems to be pretty insane, but there's a lot of pretty hardcore reefers, particularly in the SPS crowd, which are using it now because they're so tired of finding new pests. I have to say, we used it on 100 plus frags that we got for the SPS, LPS, and softy videos. We didn't see a single coral respond poorly to it. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I think it's going to be my go-to dip from here on out for most corals. One of the things about dipping is it generally only kills or stuns the adults and juveniles, meaning that they'll either die or just freak out and let go of the coral. That's why giving them a really good swish in the dip and then rinsing them in salt water after is a good idea. With bear, it's a good idea to use two rinse buckets. I don't want any of that in my tank. What it doesn't kill or remove is the pest's eggs. It might be possible to find them all visually, but not likely. Your best bet is to move your corals to a temporary quarantine system after the dip and watch them for at least a month to make sure they're healthy. I might even dip them after, again, before adding the coral back to the display, primarily just to be safe, as well as so I can look at the bottom of the cup and make sure there's nothing nasty in there. This will be harder on the coral, but the most aggressive reefers or those with the most to protect might proactively dip throughout the quarantine process in an attempt to break the reproductive cycle as well. More or less, that's all you can do. Start with dead dry rock, buy your corals from a trustworthy source, inspect them, dip them, and quarantine. If I had to rank the importance weighted with the practicality and cost, I'd say starting with dead dry rock and dipping are of equal weight, followed by inspection methods and sourcing. And while quarantining is an awesome idea, it just isn't practical for a lot of reefers out there. Okay, let's talk some basics on some of the more common pests. I'd say basics because each of these could rightly justify its own video. If you want to know specifics on each one, shoot us a question below and we'll make sure it gets answered. And RT might just add it to an episode of the 52 FAQ. It only makes sense to start with Aptasia, which is a pest anemone way too many of us are familiar with. It might not seem like a big deal at first, but eventually it can take over a tank, sting and kill everything in its path, and you will regret not putting more effort into making sure it isn't introduced into the tank. I don't think dip has a big impact on them, but inspection, sourcing, and quarantining does. If there's a single Aptasia in a store's display tank, I wouldn't buy a coral out of that tank. They most often come on the coral bases, so remove them if possible. I also see them buried in zoanthid colonies a lot, so give them a close look. Let's say it's already too late and you already have them in your tank. If it's on a single coral or easy to remove rock, get it out of the tank like immediately. If that's not possible, you can fill the hole in with epoxy or super glue, which not only kills them, but prevents them from spreading reproductive elements into the tank. It's pretty common to kill them with Kelkwasser paste or Aptasia X, but it's been my anecdotal experience that this causes them to spread and there always seems to be a tiny bit of flesh left that grows back anyways. Okay, so let's say it's too late for that and you have multiple in your tank. You may get lucky and eradicate them completely, but it's more likely that you'll just be battling them forever. Killing large ones with Aptasia X, I think, is your best bet. And then letting predators like peppermint shrimp eat the babies. There's a nudibranch called Bergia that eats them, but they're often expensive and starve before they find every last one. Some butterfly fish, most notably the copper band, but they're notoriously hard fish to keep healthy. There's also the matted or bristletail file fish, which works, but not entirely reef safe either. I'm going to group bubble algae right in there with Aptasia. Dip doesn't do much, but inspection, sourcing, and quarantining does. Once it's in the tank, remove whatever it's on as fast as possible and hope that it doesn't show up somewhere else. Sometimes you get lucky and a fish will eat it, but your best bet is emerald crabs, which will eat the smaller bubbles, so you need to manually remove the large ones. 
couple common acro pests are the dreaded little red bugs and acro eating flatworms. The bugs you can see with the naked eye if you look closely. They can be hard to see, but once you know what you're looking for, it's not that hard. Acroeating flatworms are almost impossible to see and you'll only know that you have them because your corals are dying and they appear to have small circular bite marks on them. The bugs you can be with a treatment of interceptor which you need a prescription for. Most veterinarians will be glad to give it to you once you explain what it's for. Acroeating flatworms and their hosting corals however need to be removed from the tank and individually dipped and put into quarantine. They then need to be re-dipped every three to five days for a month or so until all the eggs have hatched and you've broken the life cycle. Since a single rogue flatworm can reinfest a tank, you might also want to consider a tank transfer method as part of this, meaning after each dip, put them into a new temporary quarantine tank and empty and sterilize the last one. This will almost eliminate the chances of reintroducing them to the tank once you're done treating the corals. Meanwhile, you need to remove the food source from the tank and either remove all the encrusted bits of SPS from your rock or kill it with something like Kelkwasser paste. Without a food source, the flatworms and the hatching eggs should all die while we're treating the corals. Another note, KZ makes a product called Flatworm Stop, which works by increasing the slime coat on the coral and making it unpalatable to the acroidium flatworms. I don't think it will ever eradicate them from your system, but depending on the size of your problem, it could potentially make the problem manageable long term. And for a lot of reefers, a solid alternative worth attempting before ripping out every coral, dipping and quarantining everything. It's also something that many SPS fanatics use as a preventative measure and often combine with their coral booster. Zoanthids have a handful of pests as well with nudibranch, sundial snails, sea spiders, and zoopox. Zoopox often shows itself as tiny yellow or white dots on the zoas and eventually all the polyps close up. One of the only treatments seems to be a furin dip which can be API's furin 2 or Hikari's bifurin. For the snails, sea spiders, and nudies, the best practice is dipping and vigorous swishing, which will cause most of the adults to let go. You may have to closely inspect and physically remove some as well. The spiders often require you to remove them with a the tweezer. A lot of people use fresh water and iodine dips on the nudies. However, with the nudies in particular, a single dip which kills or removes the adults is rarely effective because a dip doesn't kill the spiral-shaped egg sacs. You have to dip every five days, which gives a chance for all the eggs in various states of development to hatch, and the frequent dips will break the life cycle by removing the juveniles before they have a chance to reach a reproductive stage. This is also the same type of thing with Mani eating nudibranchs as well. Remove them, dip, and repeat until you disrupt the life cycle. You might be best off removing them to a quarantine tank during the process and removing or killing any areas that Monty encrusted the rocks so the remaining nudies in the tank starve. No one wants to do this, and I can't blame you, but if you don't, they'll eventually kill the coral. I think at this point everyone's starting to see why sourcing, inspection, dipping, and ideally quarantining is such an important step with new corals. I think we'd all like to avoid this pest nonsense. A few other common pests that typically come on live rock, but sometimes come on large coral bases are vermitid snails, gorilla crabs, mantis shrimp, bristle, and fireworms. Vermitid snails are those encrusting tubes you can see in many tanks. When they sense food, they cast out a mucus net to trap prey or food particles. Not only are they ugly, but they can bother corals and prevent fish from grazing on algae near them. Best method of killing them is manual removal with the pliers or putting a small tab of glue in their tube opening. Some reefers get pretty bent out of shape about gorilla crabs and mantis shrimp, which can be live rock hitchhikers, particularly on Florida aquacultured rock, which was shipped air freighted in water. Fear is generally that predators like this will go after snails and crabs, and I guess potentially smaller fish. However, they are cool critters in their own right, and I think removal is somewhat optional. If you think they're causing issues in your tank, go ahead and remove them. One note on mantis shrimp is reefers claim they can break glass aquariums. It's likely possible, but probably it would have to be a pretty big one and still a pretty rare event. Bristle worms and fireworms are a pretty common sight in most tanks. They're nasty looking critters and their bristles will stick in your skin like fiberglass and burn. Sometimes the irritation will last weeks. There's some pretty rare species that also go after corals, which in general is pretty obvious and you can see happening. You can imagine why most people don't want these things in their tank. However, for the most part, they're a beneficial component of your detritus cleanup crew and really not an issue. There are some commercial and do-it-yourself traps available, but you'll never catch them all. I think the best way to reduce the chances of having a significant amount of them in your tank is to go bare bottom, use dry rock, and dip your corals. These little guys are the first to fall off the coral with pretty much any dip, so I think if you're methodical about it, it is possible to run a bristle worm free tank. These last pests I'm going to cover are intentional additions. Green star, polyp, zinnia, mushrooms being the most common, but sometimes zoanthids as well. 
All these can be really cool additions to any tank, but eventually they'll almost always take over and be just as much of a pest as anything else in the tank. So take consideration to when you put them into the tank, putting them on islands is the best idea, or pruning the encrusting edge with Kelkwasser paste is another good method. So last week we asked all of you what the best method of fighting algae is. Better feeding habits was my personal vote, but better maintenance won in a landslide victory. This week we're asking all of you, what's your favorite dip? If you learned something new in today's episode, let us know with a quick thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss out on week 49, fish disease and parasites.